and clearly um, if um, if polio is an indication of how difficult it is for to eradicate uh, a disease and we should wonder whether we should launch into more uh, eradication efforts. So let me give you a, a, a brief update of where the program is. I'll go less into the virus and more into the programmatic dimension of the effort. So um, if you compare 2018 and 2017, 2017 we had the lowest number of cases worldwide ever um, with actually uh, no case in Nigeria, only cases in Pakistan, Afghanistan. But in fact, in 2018, we've stagnated from the eradication perspective. We had uh, so far uh, uh, 20, a total of 20 cases in, uh, in Afghanistan and uh, eight in Pakistan. So 28 cases in 2018 so far, and we're not at the end of the year yet, and um, compared to 22 for the whole of 2017. The number of cases itself is not really an indication of how the program is going, but it does show that we haven't been able to interrupt transmission. One piece of good news, though, is that while poliovirus type 3 has not been detected anywhere uh, in the world for over six years now, the last time it was detected was in the Yobe state of Nigeria, northeastern Nigeria, which, of course, sort of calls for questions of whether it still circulates there because the northeastern part of Nigeria is one area under the control of Boko Haram where access is actually quite challenging. Um, but um, the Global Certification Commission uh, for the Eradication of Polio recently met and sort of considered that we are on track to certify the eradication of wild poliovirus type 3. Wild poliovirus type 2 has already been certified as eradicated. The last time was it was detected was in 1999. Uh, so we actually are, with, with regards to wild poliovirus, sort of uh, uh, fighting the type one, which we have only seen for the past two years in Pakistan and Afghanistan. <coughs> so this is um, uh, an, another map which basically shows you again the wild poliovirus, but also shows you that um, unexpectedly or perhaps expectedly, but, uh, but uh, with uh, uh, causing a lot of problems to the program, um, the eradication effort is now not only facing the wild poliovirus, but the vaccine-derived poliovirus. So the oral polio vaccine that we use, uh, which is not only a bivalent oral polio vaccine, it used to be a trivalent with type 1, 2, and 3. We removed the type 2 back in 2017. Nonetheless, uh, this uh, attenuated, live attenuated virus, uh, sort of under certain conditions when, when not enough population is vaccinated, can actually move from person to person, genetically uh, mutate, and eventually become virulent again. Um, and, you know, cause outbreaks of circulating vaccine-derived polyviruses. At the moment, we are fighting a number of outbreaks, and I'll go into the details of this, but as you can see from the green dots and the blue dots, we are, and also the yellow dots on the, in Papua New Guinea, we are fighting a number of outbreaks of vaccine-derived polyviruses. We actually have, this year, as well as in 2017, had more cases of paralysis caused by the vaccine-derived polyvirus than by the wild poliovirus, which of course sort of raises issues uh, uh, which are ethical issues of vaccination. Um, our program also um, focuses not only on cases uh, of paralysis, but also increasingly detects the virus in the sewage. So in all of the high risk areas, uh, we actually are uh, taking samples from the sewage in a number of, of geographies and detecting whether the wild vi uh, virus or the vaccine-derived polyvirus uh, is actually there. Um, and, and, you know, that gives us an indication of ongoing transmission. So for the wild polyvirus, I indicated we've had only cases in Pakistan and Afghanistan over the past two years. In fact, the last case in Africa was detected in, in September. The last virus in Africa was de detected in September of 2016 in a healthy child. Uh, since that time, we haven't had any detection in Africa. And Pakistan, Afghanistan have been the only two reservoirs of the wild polyvirus, both for cases and for environmental detection. So we haven't seen the wild virus anywhere else in the world, either in sewage or in cases, uh, but in Pakistan, Afghanistan. But we also detect through sewage um, uh, sampling the uh, vaccine-derived poliovirus. In 2014, under the International Health Regulation, which is the this regulation that sort of uh, uh, all member states have signed about, uh, uh, against in back in 2005, 
under the International Health Regulation, the Director General of WHO declared a public health emergency of international concern with regards to the risk of circulation, of international circulation of the wild virus. This imposes on the infected states uh, requirements for vaccination of travelers, uh, visitors and travelers, and of course sort of uh, puts a lot of burden on these countries. This declaration of public health um, emergency of international concern was made in May of 2014. And every three months since that time, the emergency committee convened by the Director General of WHO has been meeting. It actually met again uh, yesterday and sort of has since that time reaffirmed that the risk of international circulation of the wild virus and now of the vaccine-derived polyvirus constitute a public health emergency of international concern. Um, this, the, the, the burden put on countries or the the uh, pressure put on countries to vaccinate travelers and also sort of do something about uh, avoiding the international risk of circulation is, is quite substantial. So it's not a, a negligible sort of declaration. So let me drill down into uh, the situation in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Pakistan and Afghanistan, we treat them as one epidemiological block. Uh, you know, they have a, a very large uh, border uh, uh, between the two countries. And over the past uh, several years, we've seen ongoing transmission in three corridors, uh, as well as in Karachi as, as a reservoir. And you see here the, the three corridors, the northern corridor, which is uh, uh, basically um, uh, here, the, 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 the Peshawar area in, in, uh, in Pakistan corresponding to Kunar, Jalalabad in, in Afghanistan. The, the southern corridor, which is the southern province of Kandahar and, and, uh, and Helmand in Afghanistan, and the current forming Quetta block in Pakistan. And we have also sort of a central corridor, which is less active here, uh, which is the southern Khyber uh, Pakhtunkhwa and the Fatah in Pakistan. Um, and we, as you can see on this map, um, uh, in blue, you see the detection of, of the virus in the environment, and in red, you see the, the polio cases. And this is over the past 12 months. So you see ongoing circulation of the virus in these three corridors. And you see also in the southern part of, uh, of uh, Pakistan, in Karachi, uh, sort of ongoing detection in this megapole, uh, which is uh, um, um, Karachi, uh, where we haven't been able to interrupt the circulation of the virus. This gives you a bit more um, fine tuning of the, of the virus itself. We actually do a lot of genetic sequencing of the virus to actually better understand you know, which clusters continue to uh, circulate, which clusters do not circulate anymore. We have a number of clusters that still circulate and are detected either in cases or in environment uh, sampling or in both. Um, but you see that we actually haven't uh, seen, for the past two years, we haven't seen a sort of a reduction of the genetic diversity of, of the virus. We continue to see a number of chains of transmission. Uh, some of them are more predominant but continue to... Uh, to circulate. Uh, if I look at Afghanistan in more detail, um, so s I say here 19 cases. In fact, we have 20 cases as of yesterday, so I, I'm sorry I did not update this, but this is double the number of cases that we had at the same time of the year last year. Um, we have ongoing transmission of the wild virus in the northern and southern corridor. Of course, Afghanistan has a major uh, challenge, which is access. We're not able to access the children because of the control of the, of, um, the lack of control by the government of some provinces in, in the country. The, uh, the, the Taliban's, which are controlling part of the country, have actually not been against vaccination. We've been able to carry out vaccination campaigns in, in the provinces under the control of the Taliban, who also sort of wish to protect their children. But for political reasons, at some, at some point, it becomes more or less complicated first to ensure that the quality of the vaccination is done uh, at the level that we want to see, also to verify, to monitor the quality. And sometimes, as is uh, the case since May, the Taliban's have banned uh, the, the team is going from house to house to vaccinate um, uh, all children under five years of age. We actually need to go from house to house. Some of the children, you know, very, very young children don't go out. They will not be taken by their mothers outside of the household. And therefore, we need to go into the house. We actually employ female health workers to go into the houses to vaccinate. But the Taliban have banned this house to house vaccination because of the, the concerns that we may be, or the program may be collecting information that then would be used uh, by the international coalition to, you know, 
target attacks on, on the, the, the heads of the Taliban. So since May, we've been missing every month uh, approximately a million children in the vaccination campaigns, which of course has resulted in this sort of increase in the number of cases and ongoing circulation of the virus. You can see here on this, on this graph the number of children that are have not been accessible in 2018 that have sort of, a, sort of leaped up uh, tr uh, tremendously. And clearly the, the, the assessment of the situation in Afghanistan is that uh, unless we are able to, uh, to gain access to this population, it's going to be very difficult to interrupt the circulation of the virus. In Pakistan, um, we've had so far eight cases, the same as we had at the same time of the year last year, uh, a bit more than what we had at the same time of the year last year. We had in total eight cases last year, but only five uh, at the same time um, um, in November. Um, the, the, pro the program has made tremendous progress in Pakistan. The government has really taken the uh, issue extremely seriously, has sort of secure access and security to the vaccinators. For a period of time, it was actually very dangerous to vaccinate against polio. You may have heard of concerns raised at the time that uh, bin Laden was, was sort of uh, uh, found and, and, uh, and, and killed, that you know, uh, the, the, the access to, to his house was actually engineered through uh, a vaccination team. Um, uh, and, and that resulted in many, many attacks against vaccinators, polio vaccinators, which uh, really saw a, a sort of a setback for the program. Since then, security has been guaranteed by the government. The, the program can operate throughout the country, but there are increasing uh, numbers of families that refuse vaccination, um, you know, for a number of reasons, religious reason or also sort of lack of trust with the government. Uh, and so on and so forth. So, you know, we have uh, continued circulation in the country and we're trying to identify the, the strategies to better get access. So the main risks here are the continued transmission in the southern and, and northern corridors. In northern corridor, I didn't mention it, but on the Afghanistan side, it's more complex than just having the Taliban refuse house-to-house -house vaccination. We have a number of factions there that are fighting against themselves, uh, so there's no one command and control that we could negotiate with to gain access. There's also ISIS being quite active there, so it's, it's uh, both dangerous and extremely complex to, uh, to gain access. Um, we also are facing the situation of very highly mobile population that mo are mobile within Pakistan, but also between the two countries, going for uh, trade reasons, for family reasons. Sometimes it's too hot in one area, so on a seasonal basis they move from one part of Pakistan to another part of Afghanistan and back and forth. So it's, it's actually a very complex situation to track those population. Um, we have also a very weak routine immunization program in both countries, which of course means that the immunity of the populations against any type of polio, but any type of vaccine preventable disease uh, is actually very low. And we have not only outbreaks of polio, but also outbreaks of measles and, and other vaccine preventable disease. And as I said, there is resistance against um, uh, vaccination. Um, you know, some is more open and some is more sort of uh, uh, hidden. Uh, and this resistance we're trying to understand better. Of course, one of the reasons of resistance is that we keep going to these communities trying to vaccinate their children only with polio drops. And, you know, increasingly we're being told, you, know, you travel great distances, you're coming with your vaccinators, but what we need is not polio drops. What we need is water, is sanitation, is, is food, is, is other health packages. And of course, this is, this is a major concern of the program and, and it was highlighted by a recent external evaluation that was done that we actually, if we want this population to accept vaccination to eradicate the disease, then we need to be able to uh, sort of serve this population which are deprived from everything with m sort of more than just polio uh, uh, vaccine. Uh, in Nigeria, let me tell you a bit about Nigeria because um, in 2016, July and August, after two years without a single case and detection of the wild polio virus, we had suddenly an outbreak of polio in the northeastern part of Nigeria, Borno State. And this is a map of Borno State. Um, back in 2016, July and August, uh, we estimated that we had approximately 650,000 children under 15 years of age that were trapped with their families in this state under the control of Boko Haram. Uh, and that's why the virus was actually continuing to circulate undetected because the populations were not only sort of affected by, by conflict there, but they were not able to get out of these areas. 
And that's why the surveillance system was actually not working at all. Um, since then, the program has been extremely active, trying to gain access. And of course, the military is also sort of a, uh, trying to gain access, re regain access to this area. So now we estimate the population trapped uh, to 70,000 children, you know, ch children under, under five years of age. So there's been tremendous progress. And you can see here on this map the red, which is you know, the settlements that are not accessed by vaccination or surveillance uh, and, and moving into a, a more green uh, although we still uh, estimate that there are um, a, a large number of settlements, 6,000 settlements, where we cannot access for vaccination. Now, is the virus still circulating in this area? It's difficult to say it is not, uh, because as long as we don't get full access. But of course, the likelihood that it is <coughs> continuing to circulate is very low, uh, but we still need to gain access. It's been two years since we detected uh, wild poliovirus in Nigeria, over two years, the Global Certification Commission wants to see more data from this area before it actually can certify. And we normally sort of take a three years uh, as a reference to, uh, to say that we are confident that the virus no longer circulates. So by the end of next year, uh, we'll be in a position, if access continues to be gained, to uh, determine whether the virus is circulating or not and whether we can certify eradication. I mentioned that we have had and we are fighting at the moment a number of outbreaks of vaccine-derived poliovirus. Uh, last year, we had a major outbreak in Syria. Uh, and the, the, the sort of epicenter of that outbreak was Deir Zor, which was the, the headquarters or the, the center controlled by uh, ISIS. Um, uh, under extraordinary circumstances, the team in this, um, in this area, the vaccinators from Syria, as well as the international NGOs and coalition that uh, worked uh, to eradicate, to, to interrupt this transmission, were able to actually stop this outbreak. We had a total of 27 cases, uh, and uh, the last case hasn't been seen, was seen over 12 months ago, so we consider this outbreak to have been uh, interrupted. However, we have a number of other outbreaks. We have two separate outbreaks in Nigeria, in the northern part of Nigeria, also of um, vaccine-derived poliovirus type 2. Uh, and, and I can explain uh, later on why we have type 2. The, the uh, problem with this outbreak is that now it has spread in Tunisia. So we have international exploitation of this outbreak with a number of cases, six cases in Nigeria. And we have uh, three other um, zones of outbreak. One is the Horn of Africa, uh, which has initially been detected in Somalia with um, uh, vaccine-derived polioviruses detected in the sewage back in October of last year. For a long time, we actually continued to detect it in the sewage. We didn't see any cases, and now we actually have uh, five cases of, of pyrotic disease. We also have a co-infection with type 3 uh, vaccine-derived polioviruses, and we've detected the virus also in the sewage in Nairobi in Kenya. So it's, it, there is sort of the Horn of Africa uh, affected area where we conduct campaign both against type 2 uh, as well as uh, against type 3, and we've actually included Ethiopia. So the whole, uh, a number of provinces of Somalia, Ethiopia, and, uh, and, and, and Kenya are sort of uh, fighting this disease. Uh, Another more concerning outbreak, or there are three different lineages of outbreaks in the Democratic Republic of, of Congo. Um, as you can see here on the map, uh, you know, the orange, uh, red, and blue. So the blue one was uh, detected in 2017, has now stopped, seems to have stopped. There's another emergence, which is red, which started in Olomami, in the southern part of the country, which spread to the border of Uganda, but seems also to have, to have been interrupted and another one, which is uh, the orange one, which is in, in Mongala with sort of uh, ongoing uh, circulation. The risk here is that, the, again, the, the, the base immunity of the population is, is very low, and we run the risk of sort of further spread and international spread of this outbreak. The additional complica complication is you may have followed that there, is, uh, there have been Ebola uh, outbreaks in, uh, in DRC, several Ebola outbreaks, and uh, the most recent one in North Kivu is actually sort of a um, also in the areas where we would like to vaccinate against polio, and that's, that's preventing vaccination against polio. So the Global Polio Eradication Initiative has a strategy which is running from 2013 to 2019. Uh, it has four goals. The first one I mentioned, which was stopping the uh, uh, circulation of, of uh, wild poliovirus. The second one was to withdraw oral polio vaccine. Why do we want to withdraw oral polio vaccine? Because it's the source of the vaccine-derived polioviruses and introduce the inactivated poliovirus vaccine. So we started that effort back in 2014. 
Uh, at that time, we had 126 countries that were supposed to introduce the inactivated <coughs> poliovirus vaccine. As you can see on this map now, only three countries had not yet introduced the vaccine. We had shortages of supply at the global level, but now this is sort of a, uh, 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 handled, and we now are able to get access to all of these countries. This is an unprecedented achievement in terms of introduction. As you can see here, uh, how hepatitis B vaccine was introduced, and you see the last uh, curve of IPV sort of with a very rapid uptake. It doesn't mean that coverage is very high, <coughs> but it means that countries now have the vaccine in their system. Um, unfortunately, because of supply shortages, we have approximately 43 million children that have not been vaccinated with IPV. That means they don't have the base immunity against type 2. Back in April 2016, we globally withdrew uh, the oral polio vaccine type 2 to avoid uh, the outbreaks. And um, you know, uh, we have now 43 million children that haven't been vaccinated with IPV that will need to be caught up when vaccine uh, supply is sufficient. Eradication is one good thing, but once you get rid of the natural disease, you need to make sure that the virus does not get reintroduced into the populations. Um, and unfortunately, or you know, uh, thankfully, we now have a, a mapping. There are a total of 27 countries in the world that have declared that they will be continuing to handle the wild poliovirus and the vaccine-derived poliovirus type 2 in a total of 79 facilities. All of these facilities need actually to operate and handle the virus uh, uh, under a sort of a, a, a containment uh, regulations that to ensure that there is no leak and no problem into the, the population. Uh, this is not anecdotal, as you probably have, uh, know that the last cases of smallpox was in the UK. Uh, and uh, last year we had an, uh, a sort of release of a uh, wild virus from uh, a factory uh, in um, in the Netherlands into the population. So there, thankfully there was no outbreak, but the virus leaked outside of the factory uh, of producing IPV into the population. So this is, these are accidents that can occur and we need absolutely to make sure that containment regulations and containment procedures are in place to avoid that we reintroduce this virus into the population. How do we certify eradication? This is of course something that we've been talking about increasingly because as we get rid of the wild virus, we have uh, vaccine-derived poliovirus. So people are saying, are you going to certify the eradication of polio while you continue to have uh, circulating vaccine-derived poliovirus? So the Global Certification Commission met and is actually sort of recommending to the Director General WHO a sequential approach, which will take the wild poliovirus first. So we probably will certify uh, wild poliovirus type uh, three, you know, sometime uh, next year or early 2020. Uh, and then uh, wild poliovirus type 1 eradication, and then the vaccine-derived poliviruses will not be certified as eradicated because they are vaccine-derived, but they will be, their absence will be verified. We're developing a new strategy. Um, unfortunately, we haven't been able to eradicate to interrupt the transmission, so we actually are launching a new strategy development, which is be, will be a very highly consultative process for uh, the period 2019-2023. And, you know, it, it will highlight, uh, you know, what is going to be new and what we do to actually get us to eradication. Um, the um, next steps for us are at the, at the global level, basically, to develop this strategy, to fundraise for it. We have to fundraise a large amount of money, uh, $3.27 billion for this five years have got to be raised. We need to maintain the political commitment in the face of very, very tough program uh, in Nigeria, Pakistan, Afghanistan, but also in the countries that are vulnerable uh, to reintroduction of the virus. And, and of course, sort of uh, try to address the fatigue of the populations uh, for this uh, repeated vaccination um, you know, campaigns. Uh, outbreak countries, you know, as you see, we have a, uh, an outbreak in Papua New Guinea, which is a country that has been polio free for many, many years, but we have an outbreak of vaccine derived poliovirus. This is costing us $25 million to fight. Uh, so it's a, a pretty challenging uh, uh, thing, and we need to make sure that population immunity is kept high to avoid the recurrence of these outbreaks. Thank you very much.